gravity, but in quantum gravity, but in gravity, most of the time, the time is meaningless because time is just a coordinate which can be changed by arbitrary uh, diffeomorphism. Yeah, time, uh, time diffeomorphisms. Okay, so so that causes lots of problem when we try to interpret what evolution means in uh, uh, in gravity, uh, uh, in particular in quantum gravity, etc. So. Um, but in idea, here I say most of the time, because in some situations, for example, in ADS, the situation is actually better because in ADS, there's an absolute uh, asymptotic time because, um, uh, because ADS has a time-like boundary and from our standard definition of gauge transformations of different, yeah, the sort of standard definition of the gauge diffeomorphism that should go to uh, identity at infinity. So, so the time at infinity is actually uh, um, reparatization invariant under the standard, the gauge transformation, okay? So that time actually has absolute meaning. And of course that is identified with the boundary time and this underlies uh, our standard story for ADS CFT. So that's uh, is also the reason the quantum gravity in space times of other asymptotics appear much more difficult because there's no such asymptotic time we can try to talk about evolution or, or try to talk about quantum mechanics. So, but even in ADS, there are many puzzling questions. So the obvious question is that can the asymptotic time be sensibly extended to the interior? By sensibly means uh, 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 we mean uh, uh, in the way which is diffeomorphism invariant. Okay, of course you can always introduce some kind of coordinate time uh, uh, in the bulk, and uh, we believe often, yeah, we believe certain physics reflected by that coordinate time should be somehow diffeomorphism invariant. But the question is whether there's a uh, 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 um, yeah well defined way to uh, to see that. Anyway, so, so if the box space time is time translation invariant, if there's a symmetry, say time translation symmetry, and then indeed uh, uh, we can sensibly extend this asymptotic time to the box because now uh, we can define a preferred time slicing uh, uh, in the box geometry. But for general time dependent case, the, the situation is far from clear because now uh, there's no symmetry to give us a preferred slice and what time, yeah, what time is meaningful then it's become uh, uh, not very clear. So here we want to, um, so here, uh, so interesting intermediate example is internal black hole in ADS. Okay, so, so, so this is a familiar story in ADS, which an internal black hole in ADS should be described by two copies of your CFT in the uh, uh, in the sum of your double state, okay. and the, the, there's no interaction between the CFT, and the, but they're entangled. Okay. So this geometry is interesting. It's because for this geometry there exists a time-like killing vector outside the horizon. So because of this uh, killing symmetry, because of this uh, time translation symmetry outside the horizon, which we can actually sensibly extend this boundary asymptotic time to the region outside the horizon. But, but this geometry does not have a global killing, a time like killing vector, okay? So you can only, uh, 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 so the extension of the boundary time actually stops at the horizon, okay? Because of the region inside the horizon, there's no time like killing vector. And uh, so, yeah, so this is an interesting intermediate case, which we have part of the space time which we can actually extend uh, uh, the symptotic time to the interior, but not the full space time. Okay. Yeah, of course this feature actually, uh, yeah, so there's a time-like killing vector outside the horizon. So this feature of course is the source of many mysteries we have regarding internal black holes in ADS. For example, what, are the, uh, what is the interpretation of this F and the past regions? Uh, say in the boundary, can we give uh, intrinsic boundary theory description, say of 
such geometric regions. And what, how do we describe cross-collect time? Okay, so, so we can extend the swashu, we can extend the boundary time to the box washout time. But, uh, but if you want to explore behind the horizon, then you need emergent cross-cut time from the boundary. Okay. So, and also, how do we see actually there's a sharp horizon and associated coastal structure? say intrinsically from boundary theory point of view. And also there's puzzling questions regarding you can send, say if you have say excitations from the right and the L regions, and then you can uh, send, ex send excitations and they can fall into the uh, black hole and interact with each other. So even the original CFT they don't seem to be intact with each other. Yeah, there's no interaction between the CFTL and the CFTR. They're just in the entangled state. Okay, so how do we interpret these kind of interactions? Uh, so, so all these say kind of mysteries are related to the uh, 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 the mystery of how to how do we understand the bulk time. So, so let me uh, just quickly mention, so, so what's the long description say of the bulk evolution uh, uh, using the boundary? So the simplest one is of course the H, uh, uh, we can evolve the boundary CFT by HR minus H, HL. So HR is the Hamiltonian say of the boundary theory. So the R corresponding to the Hamiltonian for the right theory and HL is the Hamiltonian for the left theory. So this operator have a sensible description in the bulk as just time translation in terms of the swashio time. Okay, so if you have a t equal to zero time slice, then as some finite t, then then uh, uh, um, then the action, uh, uh, yeah, then time slice become like this. So this evolution uh, uh, is completely smooth in the bulk. Okay. So you can also imagine a, a, a evolution say with hr plus hl. Okay, so heuristically, uh, this HR plus HL uh, uh, acts on the uh, black hole geometry like this. Yeah, so, so this HR minus HL, of course, uh, uh, no matter how you evolve it, is always uh, uh, outside the horizon. So you can try to do it HR plus HL. Actually, this action is not well really defined because the action actually creates a kink uh, near the horizon, okay? And so this is related to that the, when you look at yeah, this is related to the uh, uh, issue that when you go to um, in the large n limit, yeah, because the geometry is described in the large n limit of the boundary theory, and in the large n limit, the 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 when you go to the uh, sector which involving black hole states, <clears throat> neither the Hilbert space or the Hamiltonian is well defined. Okay, yeah, so that's a source of this kink. But we would like to see. So in order to explore the region behind the horizon, yeah, even if you allow this kink, uh, the HR plus L, uh, HL only explore the region outside the horizon, which is just, um, yeah. So, so what we would like to see is some kind of smooth evolution, okay, so from T equal to zero slice into some other Cauchy slice, which can actually cross the horizon so that we can actually really see the region behind the horizon. Okay. And so, uh, so likely this kind of evolution can only be emergent because the, we already used the Hamiltonian given to us. And uh, um, yeah, um, yeah. So, so the goal of this talk is to explain actually how to use the boundary theory to construct intrinsically this kind of Kruska-like time evolutions. Okay. And also we will explain uh, from the boundary theory point of view, how does the horizon and the associated uh, causal structure arises? Okay. So, uh, so I want to emphasize, so in the past, of course, there are many, many work to explore the region behind the horizon uh, using the boundary theory. And uh, for example, look at various correlation functions, entanglement entropy, complexity, all those observables, they involve say when you compute them using gravity, they involve say a geometry behind the horizon. But 
but none of those observables actually intrinsically uh, uh, tells you uh, 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 how the uh, geometry behind the horizon arises. Okay, and uh, also there are HKL kind of construction, which if you put the operator, say uh, say inside the horizon, then you can express it them in terms of boundary operators. Yeah, for example, uh, um, yeah, HKL and the Kyriak and the Raju, they have uh, 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 yeah described that. But our purpose is different. So, so our purpose is not say just to express the <clears throat> the boundary. Yeah, this spark operator inside the horizon expressed in terms of the boundary theory, uh, which which in their previous constructions they actually used the input of the bark time. So here we want to really see where does the bark time emerges. Okay, so uh, so we want to do everything. Uh, 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 yeah, to understand the the bark time itself from the boundary theory. Okay, so here is the, uh, uh, the plan of my, my talk. First, I will outline the main result. And then I will talk about, say, the, uh, the where, yeah, the, some kind of uh, uh, background behind the dot result, which is the, um, which I will remind you a little bit, the, the entanglement structure for relativistic quantum field theory. And in particular, the structure of the type one monomial algebra. I, I, in describing entanglement in the uh, in quantum field theory, and also uh, I will describe this uh, uh, some special structure associated with this type three y volume algebra, that's called the half-sided module inclusion translations, and then I will describe how we actually construct this emergent time from the boundary theory, and uh, and then I will end with some conclusions. So so before I proceed, do you have any questions? Okay, good, good. Then I will just describe the main result. So, so the main result is the following. So we will show there exists evolution operators on the boundary, which we can say there exist some operators, say Hermitian operator G, which we can construct in the boundary. And then we can construct the, uh, uh, the one parameter unitary transformation associated with this parameter, uh, 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 this commission operator G. And uh, this G satisfies the following properties. First, that actually it involves the both R and L degree freedom in a highly non trivial way. So it's not like HR plus HL, uh, uh, which you just, yeah, just, just add them. Uh, a fact, yeah, so, so you don't have the factorized structure. And the second, which more important property is that this G is actually bounded from below. Okay. So G, then that means G actually behaves like a Hamiltonian. Okay. So normally, so in quantum mechanics, how do we distinguish say time translation from a spatial translation or, or other internal symmetries? So, so what distinguishes the time translation is that the generator of time translation, which is Hamiltonian, has a spectrum which is bounded from below. So in contrast, say if you have a spatial translation which corresponding to momentum or some internal symmetry, uh, you certainly don't have this property, okay? So, 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 so this property which makes this S, we can qualify it as a type, okay? We can qualify it as a type. So now you can, now you can act this unitary transformation on the operator in the, for example, in the right region of the black hole space time. Okay. So, so here, our input is that we will assume that using the standard, yeah, because we can extend the boundary time to the region outside the horizon. So we have a straightforward description of the region outside the horizon using standard ADSAFT dictionary. And in particular, any, any local operator outside the horizon Okay, for example, in the R region, we can just treat this as, as some kind of boundary operator. Okay, so this you can all either think of it as HKLL or think of it as the way, say, just think about the mode expansion of this bark field, say, in the R region. And then the A and the A dagger, when you write the mode expansion, so that A dagger is essentially the boundary operator. Okay, it's the, 
the boundary operator for the generalized free field in the in the boundary theory. So so anyway, the so our input is that we can treat the any uh, operator outside the horizon as some kind of boundary operator. Okay. And so the and so the and now we can just evolve such a boundary operator, okay, which does have a geometric interpretation in the box using this evolution operator. Okay. And then we will see actually this, this such kind of evolution can actually uh, show the sharp signature of a horizon and, uh, and essentially generate for you the region inside the horizon. Okay. So, so yeah, so take it inside the horizon for sufficient large S and keep a sharp signature of the horizon and generate the, uh, the future and the past region from the right and L region. So Hong, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in GR, the time evolution can be space dependent, right? So here, your yeah, what is the constant time slice here correspond to in the bulk? Yeah, right. So so here we we just consider so this evolution operator you should imagine it as the uh, uh, evolution operator which shifts the whole time slice. Yeah, yeah, but what is that time slice? Is the oh, uh, 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 the time slice will uh, uh, I will show you. Uh, uh, actually, the infinite number of such US you can construct, and I will you show you some examples of such okay, time okay. slice later. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's uh, yeah, but presumably you can construct also local time evolution or not. That's right, you can. In principle, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah just yeah. say which is not homogeneous in the uh uh, uh yeah which. Which we say have some non-trivial dependence on the spatial coordinate. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, Hong, maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, connected to Atis's question, this U of S uh, will not uh, necessarily be local in the bulk, right? It will not. It cannot be represented as a local evolution of the slice. Is that isn't that not correct? Uh, yeah, we will see. Actually, in certain regime, there can be. Uh, uh, that can be represented as a local slice, uh, 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 the local evolution. And in general, indeed, the evolution is non-local. And by in certain regime, uh, 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 can appear as a local, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and the, uh, uh, yeah, I want to emphasize this G, you should view it as some kind of global Hamiltonian, which involve the whole slice. It's not some kind of local, uh, uh, yeah, it's not some local action. The G is just the, it's more, G is something you have been already integrated over the whole, uh, the whole Cauchy surface. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a global operator, yeah. Okay, uh, so- Can I also ask? Sure. Uh, so if I evolve for long enough using this uh, G, would I also see the singularity? Indeed, yeah, yeah. So we should, yeah, uh, 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 we should. So, 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 but to see the singularity explicitly in our construction, actually, it's a little bit tricky. So, so I would say that aspect is not completely uh, settled. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just technically, to see it, uh, to see a see a sharp signature of the singularity, uh, 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 it's a little bit tricky there. So. Uh, yeah, I believe we should see it, but we haven't really uh, a pinpoint very precisely yet. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so so in the case of BTZ, you can actually um, work it out very explicitly. Uh, yeah, actually, say if you we be, now we believe if you do the JT gravity, say if you do two-dimensional, so BTZ is three-dimensional. If you do two-dimensional, uh, actually, maybe the evolution is always local. So yeah, uh, uh, so here I'm just uh, uh, only describe the BTZ case. So for BTZ, actually, uh, you can construct such kind of US explicitly. And uh, so again, uh, uh, we will look at this kind of evolution. And then it turns out, say, yeah, let me just describe what happens for one example of such kind of US. Okay, so one example which we can uh, uh, work out. So, so you find that they actually exist at S0. So, so S, 
equal to zero is just the identity, and then you evolve it with either s greater than zero, s smaller than zero. And so for this particular choice, for some particular choice of this US, we find that there exists, say, some finite value s zero greater than zero. And for s smaller than s zero, this operator remains in the right CFT. So remember, this operator we start from the right region of the black hole. So by definition, this is an operator in the right CFT. So we find that, the, uh, so for s smaller than s zero, this operator always exists uh, in the right CFT. But then beyond s zero, suddenly uh, the degrees freedom in the left CFT appears. Okay. And so we interpret this as a signature of a sharp right. Okay. So indeed, geometrically, that's what you would expect. When you take an operator in the right to cross to the right. Okay, so imagine you have some kind of uh, 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 evolution, take a right operator from here, cross to the horizon, and then you evolve. So before you cross the horizon, this operator is still in the right region. And, uh, uh, and so, so this operator will only involve right degree freedom. But then there's a critical value when you cross the horizon. And once you cross the horizon, you are incorporately connected with the left region. And then you must involve the left degree freedom. Okay, so, 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 so this is precisely what you expect. Yeah, so this feature is precisely what you expect uh, geometrically corresponding to a sharp horizon. Okay, but this formulation is actually general. We don't actually refer, to, we don't actually need to refer to any geometry. So you, actually, you can actually formulate this feature for any, say any quantum system, any two quantum system, you can entangle them, say in some thermal field double state, et cetera. And if such US and S0 exist, you can say somehow that these two series actually are secretly connected. Yeah, these two series secretly have some kind of emerge in the horizon, okay? And uh, a, a, a structure. So we are saying they're, they're causally connectable, okay? So that means that actually, you can actually cross the horizon and then they become connectable uh, beyond the horizon. Uh, um, Okay, so, uh, so now let me say a little bit about this value of S0. So for this particular okay, example- Can I ask you something? Yeah. So somehow this construction of generalized free field, which you are using here implicitly, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that doesn't exist for just a random, I mean, if you have a CFT without any large N limit or something like that, Good, 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 good. Yeah, indeed. You cannot indeed. really say that. Right. You cannot even start this construction, right? So, so yeah, so this is a very good point. So, so to make this definition, you don't need an RGN. Uh, 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 to make this definition, you don't need an RGN. You can just say, let's consider two quantum systems and uh, then take an operator from one quantum system, uh, from one copy, uh, from one quantum system do I exist operator which actually satisfy this feature? Okay, so, so this can be defined for any quantum system without an RGM, without any holographic description, but indeed, then you can prove, which we will not describe here uh, because I don't have time, but, but uh, 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 Sam, will, in the second uh, uh, talk, uh, uh, he will describe a proof that indeed this feature, this sharp S0 can only exist in the large limit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so even though this definition, you can define it uh, in general, yeah. Good, yeah, so this would be a proof. They do, this at least would be a, a, a I won't say a proof, at least would be a, 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 a strong argument that the horizon can only emerges in the, in the angle to infinity limit. I mean, it's a, it's a large an artifact, sort of. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this so, is not should be uh, universal in some sense. Is it what you mean by sharp? By sharpness, meaning that if I use different operators, I will always cross the horizon at the same time. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, 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 the horizon at the same time depends on your initial. Uh, uh, this time will depend on the location of your initial operator. Right, but yeah, say so, I put insert different operators at the same initial time, then I should always get the same as not, right? 
yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, 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 that answer, I don't know, uh, because we only say, yeah, just for technical reasons, we only look at the scalar operator. We didn't scan, say, all other operators. But I expect it should be the same S0. Uh, uh, it should be the same S0. But here, by sharp horizon, I mean something different. So, so sharp horizon, I mean there's a precise value of S0. Okay, there's a precise value of S0. So, so, uh, yeah, so that means the sharp horizon because it's a dike phase transition. So before the S0, uh, there's no CFTL, but, but then after S0, suddenly CFTL emerges. Yeah, so that's what I mean by sharp horizon here. And if you go to finite N, then you find such a sharp S0 does not exist. Even for, for any value of S0, there's always some tiny tail of CFTL. Thanks. Good. Uh, I have a question. So yeah. uh, you said that for uh, BTZ, this, uh, there exists such a US, uh, which presumably means that there exists uh, such a uh, uh, or such an operator G. Uh, my question is how generic is this operator G and uh, whether uh, with uh, some different operator G, uh, there, would, uh, there wouldn't be any horizon anymore. Yeah, yeah, I believe this, yeah, so this G is very generic. So, so, so we didn't, yeah, so, so our construction is very general. Does not, yeah, works for any series, say BTZ, mm -hmm. any dimension, et cetera. Uh, but we worked it out explicitly in BTZ because this is the simplest non-trivial example, which is not controlled by symmetry. So if you look at JT gravity, then emerging the US will be controlled by symmetry. And yeah, mm -hmm. so, uh, and then you can also look at higher dimension. So BTZ is the simplest, Non-trivial example, which is not controlled by symmetry, and uh, 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 um, yeah, but but the construction is very general. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Okay, good. Okay, sorry, and let me just, so. Yeah, the, the phi of x is a bulk operator, right? X. Yeah, phi, yeah, phi is a bulk operator. Yeah. So if you don't have some kind of a generalized free field construction. Yeah, how do you relate it to a boundary operator? Yeah, so so uh, so here, if you just talk about abstractly, of course, the uh, we can just formulate this. Say you can take any operator in your CFT uh, uh, to see whether this kind of phenomenon happens. Yeah, just say whether they. Yeah, for general quantum system, you can just ask the question whether they exist such operator in your right CFT that such such phenomenon happen. So if there exists such operator in your right CFT, such phenomena happen, and then you may say there's an emergent horizon. But let's see, X includes also the holographic coordinate, right? X is not capital yeah. X. Yeah. So what yeah. is the analog of that in, in a general, I see. Oh, yeah, but this, phi, but this phi X, you can just imagine it as some, complica some complicated operator in the CFTR. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but just because of the holography, we can, endow some kind of geometric meaning to this phi x. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in principle, you can just view it as some complicated operator in the in the safety. And the holographic coordinate would you would interpret it as just some scale at which the operator is defined. That, that's right. Just say because for the region outside the horizon, we have the standard correspondence based on generalized, say the bark free field corresponding to generalized free field in the boundary series. So uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, so as I mentioned, we use the we use the bulk reconstruction outside the horizon as the input. So we assume that the, you can actually use in the standard spatial time to already reconstruct the bulk, yeah, and the, the radial direction to reconstruct the, uh, uh, the region outside the horizon. Yeah, we want to see we, with that as an input, how does the interior region arise? Well, isn't this very generic? Like, couldn't I take this fire vex to be any like any two systems, right and left, and take phi to be purely in the right system and then evolve it with a generic U, wouldn't it at some point start mixing? No, no, if you just do it generically, then you will not. So if you do it generically, you either have the following two situations. Either they're always mixing, depending on your choice of U, they're always mixing, 
or the level mixing. Okay, the level mix. And the non-trivial thing here is that this exists a sharp value S0. They don't mix before S0, but mix after uh, S0. Somehow- So you are saying if I start from something that is not mixed, so is this my, my phi of X, the thing that I start from is just made of the right degrees of freedom. Then I apply a generic U that involves both right and left. Are you saying that generically it will not mix with the left? No, 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 I'm not saying that. No, I'm saying if I just take a right operator only in the right, yeah, and then I evolve it with some US involving both left and the right, uh -huh. then generically we are just always mix left and the right. Just, just even S, any infinitesimal S will already evolve. Oh, I see. You want the finite S not to, okay. Yeah. So, okay. so the non-trivial thing is that it exists the finite S0 greater than zero. Somehow before that does not mix okay. and, uh, and after that mix. Yeah, here is the, uh, 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 the most important point. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so now let me explain a little bit uh, of where, uh, the value of S0. So, so this uh, uh, value S0 actually depends on your choice of initial operator and also will depend on the, 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 uh, the US, et cetera, choice of US. So, so we can construct a particular US. And uh, so, so let me just draw the Kruska diagram uh, just here like this. And then the U and the B axis corresponding to the horizon. So, so here I'm just suppressed the, the boundary and the singularity. So now imagine we have a point, uh, initial point is in the right region with initial value U0 and B0. So, so I want to emphasize in the boundary construction, we don't use the Kruska coordinate at all. We just evolve it, okay? And then somehow this Kruska coordinate emerges. Okay, then it turns out if it happen, choose the say X, to have this u0 and b0 uh, as initial point. And then you find that this s0 is actually given precisely by the, by the law of distance uh, along the u direction uh, 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 from this point to cross the horizon. Okay, so this is, ma uh, uh, so s0 just gave you the minus u0. Okay. So there exists such a us, uh, 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 which somehow just precisely give you this minus u0. And uh, furthermore, if you take this point to be close to the horizon, and then you find that the, 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 the transformation is actually local. So actually just give you a Kruska law translation, okay? For some, for this uh, particular choice of US. And so in general, if you take X, some generic point in the bulk, in the right region, actually the transformation is non-local. Okay, the transformation is non-local. And but non local in the way which preserves the uh, causal structure in the sense you still, even though has, has a finite spread, but still it takes only the value of S0 for it to cross the horizon. Uh, 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 so, so the crossing the horizon is still sharp. Okay, so, so even though the, uh, uh, the, the transformation is non local. And you can actually explore the, uh, the causal structure a little bit more sharply. So let's consider again, this is a Kruska diagram. So the, so the U and the V axis corresponding to the horizon. And now we can consider you evolve this operator in the right region, okay, start as X1. And then you try to look at the commutator with the operator in the left region. Okay, so, so you look at the, this commutator. So, so in order for the commutator to be non-vanishing, so this evolution have to take you inside the light cone of this X2. Okay, so, so, so that's the only way. Uh, uh, the commutator can be non-zero. And then you see indeed that the similar thing happens. So, so there's a lot of distance to go from this X1 to cross the, uh, the, the, the light cone of X2. So that's essentially the law distance is this U1 plus U2. So remember the U1 is negative for the point uh, in the right region. Anyway, so even though this evolution is non-local, so here is just a cartoon. Uh, don't take this. Yeah, so this shaded region just means this operate spread, and but 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 don't take this spread too literally. Just say it's, it, 
really is a cartoon. So, so, uh, so it turns out for s more, uh, smaller than this value, again, you get zero, but then there's a sharp s value, and then indicate you have crossed the horizon, uh, crossed the light cone of this x two, and then now you suddenly find that this is non zero. Okay, again, it's like some kind of sharp transition. Okay, uh, 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 a sharp transition. So this tells you that even though this evolution is non-local, but somehow this actually somehow exhibits still exhibit the sharp causal still uh, uh, exhibits the sharp causal structure which you would like to see in the box. And uh, but actually, there's a regime. Actually, this transformation actually is local. So this for the BTZ case, this is local. When you take the uh, uh, when you take the dimension of this uh, boundary operator dimension to be large, okay, and we know that the uh, uh, when the operator dimension become large, there's some simplification, say in the two point functions, or yeah, yeah, just there's some new structure in the in the behavior of these operators. Turns out in this regime, so if we also say average over the boundary spatial direction, just for simplicity, uh, um, and then you find actually this transformation become local. In the sense, if you start with a point in the right region, and then this takes you to a lot of points, to the uh, box scalar field at a lot of points, uh, uh, evaluated at a lot of points uh, uh, on the gravity, you can match it. Okay, so so we just evolve it using the boundary operator, but then you find that the result of the evolution can be matched exactly with a with a local operator in the box. Okay. And the, uh, and the, it turns out that the transformation is like this. So, uh, so the transformation uh, uh, expressed in terms of this Kruskal coordinate. Yeah, I'm just telling you one example, because uh, 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 one to u zero plus s, and this v s uh, transform in this way. Okay. So the uh, so the Kruskal coordinate transform this way, and for u is just the uh, law shift. So we can geometrically we can draw the diagram. So if I start with a point, some point here, and then you find that the evolution for each point is just like that. It, it just evolves. You can just draw this flow, flow line based on these formulas, okay? And, uh, and this is the, this is the uh, uh, constant S slice. So if you start with S, you, uh, start with the T equal to zero slice for the black hole, and then let's see, then, then let's look at the finite some constant value of s. Then you find it actually evolves this way. Okay, so it crosses the horizon exactly. And so, so, so for this evolution, the 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 near the horizon is actually just a law of translation. Yeah, it, it's a law of translation in uh, uh, in u. And uh, we we can also construct similar transformations, which is the law. Which corresponding to the uh, law of translation in V, but then the U transformation uh, uh, will be similar like this. Okay. So, and when you say large mass, it is with compared to the string scale compared to. Yeah, this is just the large mass. Just means that the is so 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 the mass of the bulk field or the dimension of the boundary operator will always take to be large one in, or the in one the radius in the radius. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, just independent of n. It's always independent of n, but it's parametrically large. Yeah. Yes, okay. Okay. So, so the bottom line is that we want to start with the bulk reconstruction of our standard safety dictionary, say for the right region and for the left region. So if you just Using the standard bulk reconstruction, you don't really know whether this L and the right, right region are connected and whether they exist future and the right uh, past region. So by constructing this US, essentially you build this whole space-time diagram. Okay, uh, in principle, you can build this whole space-time diagram. And, uh, and uh, so, um, so this US leads to a new, say, uh, emergent important time. Okay, yeah, yeah, as I showed you, you can take you from one slice to another slice, et cetera. And uh, uh, in particular, actually, there's an infinite number of choice of such informing times. So this is uh, uh, so this is consistent with our intuition. Actually, in the 
somehow, yeah, on the gravity side, there, there of course, there's an infinite choice of times, but we are not sure whether those times are different. Well, yeah, whether we, whether, but we, normally we are not sure whether all those times correspond to some kind of diffeomorphism involving the notion of time evolution. But here actually, uh, uh, we actually see actually there, yeah, so this construction is by definition a diffeomorphism environment. Yeah, so this gives you actually infinite number of choices of diffeomorphism environment time uh, to describe in the book. Okay. Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, do you start with an unentangled state uh, or do you start uh, with uh, some sort of thermophile double? Because if they're it's always thermophile double. Yeah, it's always thermophile double. Yeah. Okay. So here I'm only talking about thermophile double. Okay. No, yeah. uh, in the sense that, uh, I mean, if you start with uh, some entangled state, then, I mean, it's, isn't it obvious that the two CFTs, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they're, uh, uh, at least in the bulk, uh, looks like the eternal ADS Schwarzschild? No, it's not obvious, right? Uh, it's 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 certainly far from obvious. Uh, it, 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 if you start, if you start with the uh, the the standard dictionary, say for the for the finite temperature is due to the region outside the horizon, hmm. and uh, and if you even think about some of your double picture, say they are, uh, they entangled, uh, hmm. it, it's not clear that actually they're connected in the box is connected. So there are various conjectures based motivated by this internal black hole geometry. Say they should be connected in the box and uh, uh, say EI equal to EPI, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but this, these are all motivated from, from already looking at the internal black hole geometry. Okay. I see. Yeah, so here we want just say, let's just start from this picture. Okay, let's just start from this picture. I know that finite temperature CFT, I can really describe it using the region outside the horizon and the same thing for here. But can I actually really construct this whole, whole connected picture? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, good. So, so, so now let me uh, uh, talk about the... Um, uh, 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 yeah, remind you, yeah, just talk about some, some features uh, uh, of this entanglement in the relativistic CFT, which we'll use as a motivation uh, to explain how we do the construction uh, uh, on the gravity side. Um, so, so first, just very quickly remind you, say normally when we talk about the entanglement of quantum systems, we say let's separate into two subsystems and we assume that Hilbert space factorizes into them and then you can construct reduced density matrix in, in some general states, you can construct reduced density matrix to, uh, to trace out one subsystem. And so, so this reduced density matrix, we contain uh, all kinds of quantum information we are interested in. Okay, for example, you can construct the uh, volume entropy, et cetera. Okay, so, so in this context, if you just know the row one, you already know essentially all the entanglement information about one and two. Yeah, uh, contain much more than you want to know, yeah. Anyway, but, but, but there are situations which is row one and row two, so you can also define row two, are both full rank, okay? Full rank means that the two systems actually are highly entangled, okay? So if they're not entangled, then row, row will be rank one, will be a pure state, that will be rank one. So, so if it's a full rank, and then that means these two uh, a sigma highly entangled. But then they are full, but when they are both full rank, actually there's additional algebraic structure. So this is, now you can define an operator like this. So called the modular operator, we take row two times row one minus one, okay. So this operator has an inverse because row two is also uh, um, invertible. And uh, so in this case, so this operator have the nice feature that when you act, the operator in subsystem one, it remains in the subsystem one. When you act, say if you exponentiate it, yeah, by some imaginary amount, so act on the operator in, yeah, it can generate the unitary flows, which still take the operator in region one, still remain in region one, and the re operator in region two, still in region two, okay. So, so this module flow generate automorphism, say of each subsystems, okay. <clears throat> the operator algebra of each subsystem. 
So the existence of the module flow also is an indication that these two systems are highly entangled. Okay. Well, this is only possible when these two are full up. Sorry, in the definition of the modular operator, uh, is there a direct product or it's uh, Sorry? Or is it just a matrix product? Oh, this is a direct product. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just using the simple location, uh, uh, simple um, uh, 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 notation. Yeah. <clears throat> So now let's go to con uh, entanglement in the quantum field theory. So let's consider QFT in the Minkowski space time. So the simplest case is just consider entanglement between two half space. So that's corresponding to, you can separate the space time into window regions. And the, so, the, so the causal diamond of the right half space is just the right window region. And then the, that one for the left window region, then you also have future and past regions. <clears throat> So it's often said that the Minkowski vacuum state can be interpreted as a sum of your double state for the right and L window patch patches. So this is a famous unroof story. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, but this statement is actually not true, strictly speaking. Okay, so the strict speaking, the statement is only correct when you actually discretize the theory. Okay, so, so if you put the system on the lattice, then and and then when L and R don't share any lattice points, and then this statement is rigorously true. Okay, and uh, but in the continuum limit, actually this statement is not correct. Okay, uh, and but but normally this subtlety is not that important for uh, for many physical purposes. Okay, but this subtlety, uh, the difference between the continuum and the discrete limit, actually is important very important for our current purpose. So let me just emphasize that. Okay, so, so I want to emphasize there are some fundamental differences between the discrete and the continuum cases. Okay. So let me just con contrast you uh, 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 the discrete and the continuum limit uh, 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 the differences. So in the discrete case, there's a local Hilbert space for L and R, so you can always factorize them. So essentially by definition, but it can, in the continuum case, there's no such factorization. Okay, so so none of uh, uh, any state which can be factorized into HR and HL actually have infinite energy in the continuum limit, and so so in the continuum limit, those states just drop out of your Hilbert space. Okay. And uh, also here, you can just trivially define reduced density matrix because you have a tensor product structure, but here you cannot because you no longer have the tensor product structure. And here you can have a finite entanglement entropy. Of course, this entanglement entropy will depend on the cutoff, lattice spacing. But when you take the continuum limit, and this entanglement entropy become infinite. Okay, it's not well defined. So the only thing remain, which is common, be uh, when you take the continuum limits, is that actually the modular operator and the modular flow exists. Okay, so so all you all other standard description of entanglement using reduced density matrix they just don't apply. And but but the module operator module flow still exists, okay. And that becomes the only way, only way we can sensibly talk about, say, entanglement in, in the intrinsic continuum limits, okay. But still, there's a fundamental difference between the module operator and module flow between the discrete and continuum case. So in the discrete case, as I mentioned before, this module operator can be factorized. You can write it as a row two times row one minus one. But in continuum limit, actually, there's no, no such kind of factorization. You cannot factorize this module operator, say, in terms of some product of the operator in the left region or in the right region. It just cannot be done. Okay. So you involve both L and the right operator in somewhat complicated, yeah, it's somewhat a more intricate way. So in particular, in this case, there's no sharp light cone. Okay, so, so, so when you put the system on the lattice, so whenever you evolve the system a little bit, and that always have some kind of small tail, exponentially small tail outside the light cone. So there's no sharp light cone. So, but of course, in the continuum limit, there is sharp light cone. Okay. So it turns out that all these all these differences between the discrete and the continuum case, which normally we treat as some kind of technicality. Okay, say when you uh, involving UV divergences, et cetera. 
some kind of technicality. It turns out all these differences, they can be attributed at the more fundamental level in terms of the difference of the operator algebra structure in the two regimes, okay? It turns out the operator algebra in the, this right window region have a very different structure when you're in the discrete or in the continuum case. So in the discrete case, you have type one monomial algebra and in the continuum limit, you have type three one monomial algebra. So we are not going into detail how to define monomial algebras and uh, uh, under their classifications, et cetera. So, so let me just say that type one monomial algebra is the one which you can always define it on the Hilbert space. Okay, so because here it's always factorized, so you can, yeah, so you can always define on the Hilbert space. In particular, here you just have the standard projection operator uh, uh, associated with the Hilbert space. But for type three one monoma algebra, actually in here, all the projectors in type three one monoma algebra, they are infinite rank. Okay, and they're equivalent to identity. So yeah, so this is highly non-intuitive non kind of algebra. And, uh, but you can view all those features as some kind of physical manifestation, say of this type three one monoma algebra, okay. Good, so the st story is very general. So you take any local region, so emphasize any local region in the, in the relativistic QFT, and the local operator algebra can be associated with the type three one monomial algebra. So it's always the type three one monomial algebra. And so this is a, a, a universal statement. And, uh, and in, in fact, this is the only way we can actually talk about uh, the modular flow associated with this monomial algebra is the only way we can talk about the, the uh, uh, entanglement between this region and the, the complement region, say, uh, uh, in the intrinsic continuum limit, okay, in the intrinsic continuum theory. Uh, 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 um, yeah. Good. So this type three one only my algebra turns out give you some additional structure, which is, a which is not present in any other kind of monoma algebras, okay. And so this new structure uh, associated with this type three one is called half-sided modular translation and inclusion. So let me just first uh, state the mathematical language. So suppose M is a volume algebra and you consider some vector which is cyclic and uh, separating for M, okay. So translates into physical language is that let's just take this M to be the Rindel operator in the right region. And this omega state can be considered just as a vacuum state of the uh, your standard Minkowski vacuum state. And the saying that this omega is cyclic and separating for M for this region in the right, uh, for the operator algebra in the right window region is the standard statement, say of the uh, Rhee Schneider, okay. Uh, 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 Schneider means that if you act the operator algebra in the right region on the, on the Minkowski vacuum, the resulting states are dense in your Hilbert space, okay? And the same thing, if you use an operator algebra in the left region to act on the uh, Minkowski vacuum, again, the, uh, again, the, uh, uh, the resulting Hilbert, the resulting space is dense in, your, in, in the full Hilbert space. Okay. So, and this cyclic separating can also be viewed as the continuum limit. The, con the language appropriate for the continuum limits what we said in the discrete case that both row one and row two are full rank. So this is like the uh, continuum generalization of that kind of statement that the row one and row two are full rank. Okay. Anyway, so, so suppose you have such a volume algebra, which is we have say, for example, for the window space. And now let's, in, let's ask whether there exists a lot of volume sub-algebra of M with the following property. Say, say this omega is cyclic for M, means that if you act N on, on omega still, uh, the resulting space is dense uh, uh, in your Hilbert space. And uh, then another property is that whether when you act the modular flow of M on this N, whether it takes you outside the N or not. Okay, so, so if, so we define uh, uh, this thing by modular translation, yeah, so, so suppose there exists some algebra which actually does not take you 
outside n for, for all the modular flow with this t parameter smaller than zero. Okay. So in this case, we say that this n and m form a pair of this uh, 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 monuma algebras, which say have this half-sided modular inclusion structure. Okay. Okay, so suppose such a kind of n and m exists. Okay. And then there's a powerful theorem from uh, uh, in the 90s by, by Borchers and uh, 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 Westbrook, uh, uh, there's a number of uh, powerful theorems. Then they showed that for type three one algebra, then there exists a unitary group US with the following property. So this US can be constructed using some op Hermitian operator. There exists some Hermitian operator which is bounded from below. Okay, and then you can uh, then construct that kind of US. Okay, so so this is a existing pro, uh, uh, statement. So whenever such structure exists, such kind of operator must exist. Okay, so as I emphasized before, whenever you see an operator which is bounded from below, spe spectrum bounded flow, <clears throat> then this is a candidate for Hamiltonian, and this is candidate for emerging time. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, they also prove that this actually, this evolution actually leaves your vacuum environment. So this is actually can be imagined, really considered as a time translation symmetry. <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, not this, no, no, it's not symmetry, this is a time translation which actually leaves your vacuum environment. Okay. So then this can be used to generate the due times. Okay, this can be generated due times. And so this is the, the structure we will use to generate the new time to uh, 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 corresponding to the Kruska time in, in the black hole geometry. Okay, so so let me just give you an example to show such kind of uh, 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 example. Yeah, let me just give you a trivial example which is corresponding to this Rindler story. So let's just take the M to be the operator algebra in the right region. So this is a monomial algebra, and now let's imagine. Let's take N. To be the sub algebra of M, which is associated with the, the operator algebra in the in this smaller wedge region of N. So N is still uh, associated with a lot of wind, infinite windular wedge, but but is the uh, but is inside M. Okay, so N is the sub algebra of M, and uh, again just from the Schneider theorem, N is cyclic with respect to the Minkowski vacuum. So the modular uh, 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 evolution of M here just the boost. So clearly, when you do the boost in one direction, this N, you take N inside itself. You don't take N outside itself. Okay. So and then you then here this M and N satisfy this uh, structure I mentioned earlier, and then in this case means they exist an operator which is expanded from below. Okay. Then you can generate a uh, 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 evolution. So then, then of course it. In this case, G is well long because, yeah, it's Minkowski uh, 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 below everything about Minkowski uh, series, and here it turns out the G just generated the translation along the x minus direction. So it turns out G here is just a long Hamiltonian uh, uh, of your uh, uh, QFT. Okay, and uh, uh, and so 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 you can also so now you can also act this U on M. So, so the U on M, so the U is just a law translation along this X minus direction. So if you act by S smaller than zero, you just translate along this direction, of course, take you still within M. And also in particular, it take you to N uh, with some choice of parameter yeah, anyway. But when you take S greater than zero, <clears throat> then you can take M to, to flow in the, in the, in the, the outside the original M. Okay. In fact, you just by taking all value of s greater than zero, you can just take m, then you can translate to generate the full f region. Okay. So so by using this kind of half-sided modular structure, if you start, if you give me the Rindler, if you only give me the Rindler right and the L region. Then I can actually construct the full Minkowski space time. Okay, I can uh, I can actually construct the full Minkowski space time uh, 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 using this structure. 
So, so this is the way we are going to construct the full black hole space time using the, uh, 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 using the right region and the left region of the black hole. Okay. So uh, I have a question, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the argument of uh, you, when you define the operator n should be uh, only negative one or any, any negative number. Sorry? Uh, the argument of time evolution operator for n, it is only negative one or any, any negative number? Oh, can be any number, can be any number. Can, uh, 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 it's from minus infinity to plus infinity. You can be any number. Oh, any number, okay. Yeah, just it's for s smaller than zero, it's take m to itself. It does mm -hmm. not, but when s greater than zero, when you take s from zero to infinity, then actually that can be, this now translation can be used to cover the full f region. And so when s take, you will take s to be minus one, just based on our original choice of uh, 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 s, and then actually just take you this to n. Yeah, n is a sub edge. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so, so this is the, in this well understand, exa well understood example, so, so, so this structure can use to uh, generate Minkowski space time from the window, okay? So let me make a comment here. You say, oh, maybe if I look at quantum field theory to use the window region to generate the full space time, uh, uh, this might be, um, yeah, maybe some triviality, but this is actually not so trivial, right? Because I actually, here I only need to assume certain algebraic structure. I don't have to assume you actually have a Minkowski space. I only need to, to have this right and the left wedge, okay? And somehow this Minkowski time will emerge out of here. Okay. Okay. So now the key is now you need type three one uh, von Neumann algebra and some appropriate chosen sub algebra. So then that leads to emerging time. Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm uh, running out of time. So let me now quickly tell you how we use this structure to actually do the do the boundary construction of the bulk emerging time. So, yeah, so you don't need to hurry. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So so the so the basic idea is that this black hole is described by by this CFTR times CFTL in the thermal field double state. Okay. So so let's go back to this description. And uh, so in the finite n, the boundary operator algebra of CFTR or CFTL. It's the uh, uh, it's so-called type one algebra, okay? Because the because the uh, be, because the operator algebra of, of the CFTR just act on the right Hilbert space of CFTR, and yeah, and, and by definition that's type one volume algebra. They're just standard, uh, uh, oh yeah, just standard operator algebra acting on the Hilbert space. That's just type one. Okay. But but the things become subtle when you take angle to infinity limit. In particular, when you take angle to infinity limit, in particular, if you want to include the states like black hole kind of states, okay. So the black hole kind of state corresponding to energy, say proportional to n square. Say if we say if we take n equal to a and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 those states have energy uh, 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 proportional to n square and dimension of Hilbert space proportional to exponential n square. So it becomes highly tricky to define that Hilbert space. And the operator algebra when you take angle to infinity limit. Okay, uh, uh, actually, uh, strictly speaking, the, uh, the angle to infinity limit don't exist. Okay, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, sector involving black holes, but we will argue actually there is an emergent type three one uh, volume one algebra in the larger limit. Okay, which is, can be well defined. And, and it is this emergent type three one volume algebra which actually leads to the emergence of the sharp horizon and the interior. Okay, so 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 leads to this informing time. Okay, yeah, actually infinite number of informing times. So so the key is to uh, to look at the algebra generated by single trace operators. So so in the large n limit, the algebra generated by single trace operators is still well defined. Okay, so, so, so when you take angle to infinity, 
So the single trace op you, you, you take any fan take any product and the sum of single trace operators. Uh, uh, and this is a well-defined algebra. And in the in the large element, as I mentioned, the original Hilbert space, including the including the black hole states, become highly complicated and not well defined. But in the large element, actually, there is a well defined Hilbert space based on a thermal field double states. So this can be constructed as following. Okay, heuristically, this is very simple. So so let's imagine we. We can just act all the single trace, all possible single trace. We can just act that this edge, all possible single trace operator algebra or, uh, or product of them on the thermal field double state. Okay. And, uh, and it turns out the space you, you generated by doing this, okay, actually have a Hilbert space structure using so called the GNS construction. Okay, GNS is the name of three people. Uh, 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 so, so you can actually. So uh, a construct the Hilbert space of uh, excitation around some of your double state. And this Hilbert space actually have a well-defined large end limit. And you can define the uh, well-defined operator algebra in this Hilbert space. Okay. And then it turns out that and then we will denote the MR, the representation or uh, the action of the, uh, uh, the single trace operator algebra in this GNS Hilbert space. Okay, so this, and uh, so this GNS field was uh, is just the small excitation, just the physics around the thermal field double. Yeah, as I emphasize. And uh, this representation of the single trace over the algebra, let me just give you a different name called MR. So MR, so AR is the uh, uh, is the single trace over the algebra of the original theory. Okay, and the MR is its representation in this GNS field space. Okay. So so this distinction is very important. So now the conjecture. Sorry, have, so a, yeah. AR is so at finite n, AR is not closed, right? I mean, yeah, that's right. So at finite n, AR cannot be strictly defined. Yes. Uh, cannot be strictly defined. But in the infinite n limit, essentially AR is the only sensible algebra you can define. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> And uh, and then then we can also define in, in the infinite uh, infinite limit this GNS Hilbert space around the thermal field double state. So now now the claim so you can also do similar thing with ML uh, AL and ML okay which is the uh, um, yeah. So now the claim is that this MR and ML are type three monomial algebra. Okay. So so even though at the finite end, the operator algebra in the CFT are type one, but but then in the infinite end limit, they, uh, then they become type three one one algebra. So there's various support we can give, or we can say partial proof. We can say to, to support this statement, say the thermal. You can argue from the perspective of the thermal, the behavior of the spectral function of single trace operators uh, that we are not going to there. You can also show that actually this algebra have this half-sided inclusion and translation structure, which is only applies to type three one theory. And so, uh, in fact, from this, one may be able to already give a, a, a construct a rigorous proof just based on this one. Okay, uh, which we do show actually they have this half-sided inclusion and translation structure. And then the finally, you can also motivate this by duality with the bulk. So this last aspect is the simplest one. Let me just talk about that. So, so on the gravity side, so in the large end limit on the gravity side, just corresponding to, <clears throat> by large end limit, we just means perturbative being one over n, okay? So in the gravity side, corresponding to perturbative in, in G Newton. So perturbative in G Newton, essentially you just have a quantum field theory in the curved space time, okay? With the G Newton as a perturbative uh, uh, parameter. And so there we can define the following structure. We can introduce how the Hawking vacuum. And then we can construct the fork space of the all excitations on the, uh, 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 on the, uh, Hutt, uh, based on the how the Hawking vacuum. Okay. And uh, so this is the standard, the fork space you can define for the bulk field, which can be defined perturbatively in Newton expansion. And we also, Called the operator algebra, the bulk operator algebra in the right region M tilde R. 
and the operate algebra in the in the in the left region and tilde L. And then the standard duality between the black hole and the the, uh, the CFT outside the horizon, so restrict outside the horizon, can be formulated using the following algebraic statement. He said the GNS Hilbert space around the thermal field double state should be identified with this fork space in the bulk. So this is our standard identification of the Hilbert space. Okay, but phrase it more precisely uh, uh, in this context. And then, then, this, then we identify this, the vacuum in the GNS Hilbert space, which essentially corresponding to the thermal field double state to the, to the uh, 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 harder Hawking vacuum. And then, then the statement of the bulk reconstruction, say for the operator in the right region and the operator in the left region can be just written as identification of the two algebras. Okay. And so, so this is, so from the algebraic statement of the standards ADSCFT for regions outside horizon just can be written uh, uh, in terms of those statements okay, in the larger limit. And now this F, ML tilde and MR tilde, they are just sub algebras, some operator algebras in some sub region in the Bach quantum field theory. And so, so, so just from the quantum field theory in the curved space time, which we do believe this type three one structure still exists. And so, so they must be, from this perspective, they must be type three one more imagined. Okay. So, so at least self-consistency uh, with the duality with the black hole geometry also implies that somehow this M and L, they must be type three one, okay? But, but the first two, uh, 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 which I think both of them can in principle be made into rigorous proofs and uh, they, uh, uh, they don't rely on this kind of bound duality. They can be intrinsically formulated from the boundary theory perspective, okay? Good. So, so now, in order to find the emerging time, we have identified this volume algebra with type three one structure, and then then to find the emerging time, we just need to find some more appropriate sub algebra. Okay, of this uh, 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 this emerging volume algebra. And so, before doing this, let me just emphasize one simple point. But it's a, oh yeah, uh, before doing that, let me just make a couple of remarks. So uh, remark. GNS is in the eight GNS is sorry. The eight GNS is a subspace of the product space, or is it for the right and left separately? It's a it, it, so H GNS is the full space. So the bulk for so the bulk uh, uh, fork space cannot be factorized between the L and the right. So this is just the full 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 cube space, uh, uh, perturbatively in G Newton, and that space. That Hilbert space cannot be factorized between L and R. So H GNS is a subspace of H right direct product with H left. So so, so that's a little bit tricky to describe. Huh, how because do you the because when you take the angle to infinity limit, when you include the black hole state, the HL, HR times HL can no longer be precisely defined. Oh, uh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but heuristically, we can say the following. We can say, let's look at notch, but finite n. Okay, we can look at just finite n, but n very large, say n to the 10 to the 500. Say we can take large and finite n. And in that case, then, then in principle, we can still talk about HR times HL because, because we still have a well defined Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we can say, then we can talk about this AR in the in the approximation, which we do one of n expansion. Okay, then, then in that case, the one of n expansion just can be considered as approximation to this finite, but not gn. Mm -hmm. and, the, and then this GNS Hilbert space is emergent in that kind of approximation. Okay. And then you may heuristically think that this GNS Hilbert space may be considered as a subspace uh, uh, of HR times HL. Yeah, in that perspective, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the mathematically, uh, I don't think the, uh, 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 you can think. 
Rigorously, uh, mathematically. Because you define it with respect to an algebra, so I see, I see, okay. That's right. Yeah, just uh, rigorously, uh, mathematically, you not say this is a subspace. Yeah. It's defined on an algebra, using an algebra and not the Hilbert spaces, okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Good. So, um, so yeah, let me just some, uh, make some uh, remarks where the theorems of half-sided modular translation ensures existence of this G and US. And finding it explicitly in general is very, very difficult. Okay, uh, we only know some small number of examples, say Rindler, yeah, etc. Uh, 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 yeah, actually Rindler is essentially the only non Yeah, the only, yeah, they, they are isolated example, but but the other examples, other than window, they are all a little bit special. So, but in the larger limit, the algebra of the single trace operators in GNS Hilbert space actually can be described by generalized free theory. So, in this limit, sorry, actually, I have an elementary question. So, yeah. uh, when you identified uh, this uh, vacuum state of CFD omega with uh, the Hartle Hawking state, uh, I mean, doesn't it already assume? Uh, the validity of ER equals CPR? No, 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 that does not. I no. Okay. So, 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 uh, yeah, so when you do the GNS construction, hmm. you start with a somosphere double state, and then you just act the operator, uh, uh, a single trace operator on this somosphere double state, and then you construct a new Hilbert space. Hmm. So, this new Hilbert space, yeah, I'm not describing the detailed construction here. So this new Hilbert space has, yeah, so essentially just each operator in this operator algebra corresponding to a state in this Hilbert space, okay? Yeah. And the, the, the vacuum is the one corresponding to the identity operator. Uh, okay. And so in that sense that the, uh, the vacuum in the GNS Hilbert space corresponding to the original thermal field double state, uh, it should be uh, 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 viewed as a mapping rather than as identification. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, mathematically it should be viewed as a mapping. Thanks. Okay, so 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 in this case, but actually there's a generalized free field. So in this case, it turns out it simplifies a lot. But it's it, still in this case, it's not easy to find the G, but it turns out it's much easier to find the US. Okay, to find the G is still difficult, but to find the US is much easier. So from what is constrained, etc. So, so uh, Sam will explain again in the second talk. So, so in that case, the, the, you can actually constrain this US if, for the generalized free field to, uh, to, to have a universal form up to a, a overall phase factor, uh, which depends on specific algebra. So, so in the generalized free field case, even though the G is still complicated to do, but actually this US actually turned out to be much simpler and you can actually constrain to some universal form and, uh, and the universal form up to a phase factor. Okay, so, so the expression of this can be essentially be fully determined up to a phase. And then the only non-trivial thing, when you find a specific sub-algebra uh, is you find that phase, okay. So, so now before talking about sub-algebra, let me just mention one quick thing which is a simple statement, but it's actually uh, a highly non-trivial, uh, uh, leads to highly non-trivial consequences. So let's just look at the causal diamond, say of some cautious, uh, uh, some slice, okay, uh, some, some region, okay, some, uh, some spatial region, look at the causal diamond associated with it. And so let's look at one slice, the operator algebra uh, uh, associated with nine slides we call A1, and operator algebra associated with another slice we call A2. So in quantum field theory, in the sign of quantum field theory, A1 is just the same as A2. It's because you can always evolve because A2 can be evolved from, from, the, from A1 through uh, Heisenberg evolution. Okay, so, so A2, uh, anything A2 can be expressed as superposition of operators in A1 and anything A1 can be expressed in terms of superposition of operators in A2. Okay, so, so they're just equivalent. But this is not true in the infinite end limits, when you look at the algebra of single trace operators. So, so this is easier to understand from the generalized free field perspective. So when you have a generalized free field defined on the 
the cause of diamond because generalized free field, they don't obey any equation motion. So there's no way to relate one Cauchy slice to another Cauchy slice. So, so the A1, A2, they're just inequivalent. So you can also form, uh, describe more generally from the, from the perspective of the single trace operator as follows. So when you try to evolve single trace operator using standard Heisenberg evolution, then, then actually that takes you outside the single trace operator algebra. Okay, the standard Heisenberg evolution, say, say let's take n equal to super Yang mill theory, and then let's look at the single trace operator algebra. The standard the Heisenberg evolution take you outside that edge. And so, so, so again, uh, 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 of course, this is just another perspective to say it, uh, uh, that this is a generalized free field. Uh, so A1 is not equal to H. Okay. And this just gives you tremendous new possibilities to generate new sub algebras, okay, because of this inequivalence. So, so now we can now talk about. So emerging the boundary times. So now let's so now let's just use the example of this one plus one dimension boundary. So let's imagine the boundary is on the circle. So this is the time direction. So this is a boundary manifold. Okay, it's cartoon or boundary manifold. Uh, so this is a, a vertical direction is the time direction, and the horizontal direction is a circle, which we identify. <clears throat> so as we said, the single trace open edge but defined for the full space time on the boundary is the type three one volume algebra. But now let's look at a sub region, sub space time region associated with say t smaller than zero. Look at all the single trace operator algebra associated with t smaller than zero. So, so this operator algebra I call the n. Okay. So now, so, so the key thing is that at the level of in the infinite n, yeah, or perturbative one of n. <clears throat> The single trace of the algebra for M and N, they are inequivalent, okay? Uh, precisely due to the reason I said here. Okay, they correspond to inequivalent algebras. If I define at N, you look at operate algebra for the full space time and the operate algebra for this sub region, they're just trivially equivalent because they're all equivalent to the operate algebra on the single Cauchy slice, okay? And but in the infinite N, when you look at single trace of the algebra, and now they are equivalent. Okay, so 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 now there's an emergent sub algebra, which is not present in the in the in the finite end case. Okay. So you, you you can also consider many other examples. For example, take the n to be the time in the above. Oh, oh, also, you can trivially show okay the 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 they satisfy this half-sided modular inclusion structure. So here the modular time just time evolution. And so this trivially satisfy this half side modular inclusion structure. You can also take the case which are inhomogeneous in spatial direction. This uh, uh, sub algebra defined in the region, which, which say defined by the uh, inhomogeneous in the spatial direction, yeah, this way, et cetera. So, so you can have infinite number of such sub algebras, and then they give rise to infinite number of emerging times. So now let me take you, just tell you this specific example. Okay, uh, this specific example. So, so as we said, so, so let's just take N to be given by this region. And now we just need to find the US associated with this sub edge. And now this is actually strongly, but actually, as we said, as a, a, a generalized free field level, we can reduce this US to a single phase factor, but finding that phase factor is still non-trivial. Okay, uh, uh, actually, it's still a strongly coupled problem because big, because this generalized free field, the correlation functions and the exactly of this generalized free field actually are controlled by the strongly coupled physics. Okay, but actually, there's a trick we can actually find this phase factor. Okay, so the trick is the following. So we can actually use the Bach duality to find the, uh, uh, this phase factor. So, so here we need to uh, make a lot of proposal. So we propose that the operator algebra in this sub region N, okay, so corresponding to the boundary space time, say for T smaller than zero, is actually can be identified with the operator algebra in the Bach, in the Braco region, in this 
region in this causal wedge of n, okay, in the black hole geometry. So in this n tilde region. So if you just draw the causal wedge of n in the bulk, and then you look at the bulk operate algebra in that region. So, so our proposal is that these two operate algebra can be identified. So we're not going to detail here. Uh, there's a various uh, a consistency check you can do, okay? And the, which we uh, give in the paper. Uh, um. So now, since now this operate algebra be become identified and this until the, actually it's a free, op free algebra in the box. Okay, now this just become generally free algebra in the gravity side. And now we can actually try to find this phase factor using this n tilde. And now that can be found, okay? And uh, it turns out this phase factor is precisely the phase shift. So now suppose we act on the scalar field, okay? Suppose we act on scalar field. And then this turns out this phase, uh, this phase factor is the phase shift for the scalar field at the horizon. Okay, uh, 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 so, the, so this phase shift comes as follows, okay? So as we know that any bulk field, if you look at the behavior near the horizon, is given by two plane waves, one corresponding to uh, a plane wave which going outside the horizon, and then one corresponding to a plane wave which go inside the horizon. Okay, and yeah, just horizon. Yeah, for any field near the horizon, just like a plane wave. And now, if you impose that this wave function is normalized by the infinity. And then that determines a specific wave sh uh, phase shift between these two uh, 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 infolding wave and outgoing wave. Okay, so, so you can imagine this as a scattering problem. Uh, you have a wave coming out of the horizon, scatter on the boundary, and then fall into the horizon. Okay, so, so this scattering problem has a phase shift. And this phase shift turned out precisely the phase shift corresponding to this, half, uh, corresponding to this US. So actually, personally, have been have wondered about this shift for many many years. So one of the first days you do the ADSFT, you write down the wave function in the box, and you see this phase shift. But that hasn't appeared in any boundary quantities, and actually now it actually appears in this uh, 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 in this US. Anyway, so, so now you can just construct. Uh, sorry, that phase shift doesn't doesn't depend on the field. Yeah. So, so the US does not depend on the field, but the action of U on the specific operator that depend on that field. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be because we cannot really write down a general US, we, because we cannot write down that general G, that is very complicated. What we can do is you can, you can okay, determine okay. the action of US on specific uh, uh, operators uh, up to your face. Yeah. Yeah, and that phase then depend on your specific type of operators, yeah. Good, and then, uh, 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 and then this way you can just construct this US explicitly, okay. And then, uh, and then this is a flow pattern we see, uh, which I showed you earlier. So this is like what we call the U time kind of shift, uh, which corresponding to you take this uh, 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 N given by this way. And then, uh, then that give you this kind of shift. And if you take the N given by this way, and then that can be argued to be dual to the bulk region like this. And then that gives rise to the cross car like V flow in the gravity side, which, which the, uh, 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 which uh, near the horizon translate along the U, uh, V direction. Okay. And again, that generates some kind of time slice. Like this. And, and then you can consider others. Uh, or you can also consider compositions of such cross car U and the V type flows. And uh, um, yeah. Uh, Anyway, yeah, so, so I'm way out of time. So, uh, so, so I can just stop here because I have already talked about the, uh, 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 the main thing uh, 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 yeah, I want to talk about. So the rest is just some, some general remarks on generalizations and, uh, and, uh, and discussions. Yeah, I can just stop here. Okay, then, then I would propose that we, um, we stop the formal part of the talk here we, and we thank uh, Hong and the uh, people who want to hear more can, can stay afterwards. So thank you, Hong. Yeah. So do you want to say a few more things about uh, Right, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. first, uh, uh, do people have questions? Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Okay. Me too, yeah. all, uh, 
So is it easy to understand why this type three one structure is really essential? I mean, in what way it is essential for this half half sided modular flows? I mean, yeah, what what is the basic idea why the type three is so crucial? And if it is type one, you cannot do it or yeah. So so I haven't really gone through very carefully the the mathematical proof. Uh, uh, it's a theorem which they can prove. I have it. What's the phys I sort of what's the basic idea? Yeah. yeah. So 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 the, I think the one special thing about this type three one uh, structure. Yeah, uh, I think the following intuition might help. Uh, um, is that the uh, this type three only for type three, only for type three the modular flow is external automorphism. And for type one and type two, they are all inner automorphism in the sense that they can be constructed using the operator within the algebra itself. And, uh, but, but, but this uh, type three actually is the, is the outer uh, 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 automorphism. And uh, yes, yeah, so I think it's this structure uh, uh, um, yeah, it's important there. Yeah, yeah, but I cannot say too much more because I don't really understand the proof very well uh, mathematically myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But sorry, Hong, but if you take your uh, you, the U of S that you compute uh, at infinite n using your yeah. techniques, and then you just take the same U and you apply it to finite but very large n. Yeah. Probably you will get correlators that seem to be reasonable as you know correlators inside the black hole right yeah 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 so the, the, the construction has some robustness under taking finite but very large n that's right that's right yeah 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 it just it's a similar it's similar to to when you can see that the ringular space when you put it on the lattice so if the lattice spacing is very small even though strictly speaking you don't have a sharp light cone so you actually lose the sharp light cone because you always have this kind of small exponential tail when you're in the lattice. And, but still, whether you have a tiny lattice spacing or whether you have continuum limits, for most purpose, they are not that different. For, for most physical questions, they're not different, even though certain sharp feature has disappeared. And uh, I would think that the similar thing between the large n and the finite, but very, uh, yeah, in good infinity and the finite, but large n. It, mm -hmm. just, both of those structures, they're there, but they always, but now they have all kinds of small tails and then, then they're no longer exactly sharp. Yeah. I, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you mentioned that uh, one of uh, the evidences uh, in favor of the fact that it's a, a type three one algebra is uh, uh, something to, has something to do with the uh, spectral functions. I was wondering what information the spectral function give you vis-a-vis -vis the type of algebra. I mean, why uh, the spectral function tells you it's uh, type three one as opposed to uh, type two infinity. Right, right. Yeah, the reason the spectral function is rated is the following. The way you construct, yeah, so this algebra is the algebra on the GNS Hilbert space. Hmm. And the way you construct GNS Hilbert space is you associate the action of the operator on the, uh, 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 yeah, you associate the action of the operator on the sum of your double states as the state of your Hilbert space, right? Mm. And, uh, and in particular, the inner product of this Hilbert space uh, are given by the two point function uh, 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 of, the, uh, of the single trace operators. And uh, so, so that inner product structure actually depends on the two point, uh, the structure of the two point functions. So that's why uh, the behavior of the two point functions actually are important for the algebraic structure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a question about, uh, oh, does somebody have a question? Uh, yeah, I, but you can yeah, go, please ahead. go ahead, Gabor. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Hong. Thanks for the nice yeah. talk. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask that you are showing these plots where like how these U of S can kind of move a Cauchy slice, uh, let's say, at t equals zero forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, but also at some point, um, you were mentioning that a property of this U of S like an, um, is that it uh, fixes the state that we define it from. Uh, so in the case in that example, you were saying that this is because uh, you know like uh, the light con Hamiltonian fixes fixes the vacuum. Yeah. Uh, but if this is a general property, that this seems a bit surprising in the term of the double, where if you have sort of like a time because there's no isometry that you would have for uh, for both forward evolution, and you expect the state to be. Um, like a non-equilibrium state. Yeah, here yeah, in this process, yeah. It seems like you act on the boundary as well. So you- Right, right. Yeah, yeah, sorry. You are, yeah, let me just understand your question. So you're asking, say the fact that this US seems to leave the, leave the uh, uh, GNS, uh, seems to leave the, uh, uh, some of your double state environment. Is that what you're asking? You say this is a little bit unintuitive? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So this is indeed very uh, uh, interesting feature uh, 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 as a consequence of that theorem. Uh, so, so this is in a sense natural from the Minkowski space point of view, in the sense that somehow your time translation somehow should not change your vacuum structure. And uh, but it's a, indeed I think it's a surprising such kind of thing can exist in this kind of curved space time. And, and somehow you can have this kind of time. Time, yeah. So, so there are several uh, 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 surprising thing here. So one surprising thing is that you can have this kind of evolution. Yeah. Normally, when we think about the Kruska time evolution uh, uh, in the gravity side, we say, oh, if you want to write down a, a <coughs> evolution operator corresponding to Kruska time evolution, then then the corresponding Hamiltonian must be time dependent. You cannot, uh, uh, it must depend on some kind of time you, because there's no global killing vector, okay? But the fact that you can, that exists, yeah, then, then when you write the evolution operator, that will be corresponding to some complicated past ordered, say, say evolution operator. Yeah, because your Hamiltonian should be time dependent. And but the, uh, one surprising thing is that uh, there exists this all infinite number of G, which I, uh, you can just exponentiate it, okay, to uh, to generate this kind of time flow. Indeed, so this is one surprising thing, and another surprising thing is that this G turns out uh, uh, violate your uh, GNS, uh, yeah, violate the sum of your double state. So in the sense that this is really some kind of global time evolution of your theory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, despite that you have this kind of curved space time structure. Yeah. I have a question. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't understand exactly where in the construction you need that there is a left and a right. So suppose that you only have the right uh, CFT. Mm -hmm. uh, can't you equally well define this subalgebra and construct the U of S and define everything uh, just using the, the right side? Right. So, so yeah, indeed. So, so it depends on. So, if you just start with the right algebra, then if you just act on, say, say we just, yeah, you can do it in several ways. You can, yeah, let's just start with the right algebra. You can either act on the density operator, thermal density operator, or you can act on the sum of your double state. In either way, you will get the same GNS Hilbert space. And in the same way, there's always a left algebra will be generated from this procedure. So, so even if you don't start with the left, the left will be automatically generated. I mean, or, or isn't it that you will not have a cyclic separating vector, right? I mean, if you did not have the left, what vacuum will you choose? So, 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 so for example, you, yeah, so you don't have to, so in order to generate this GNS Hilbert space, you don't have to say, yeah, say this, do the following thing. Let's just take the right algebra. Let's just purely take the right CFT. Then act on the thermal density operator. And they don't have to uh, talk about the left at all. Just act on the thermal density operator. It okay. turns out it's a feature of this GNS construction. 
such kind of construction automatically purifies the state. Okay, so this GNS, uh, so this density operator under this GNS construction is mapped to a pure state uh, in the GNS Hilbert space. And, uh, and, the, uh, and the left algebra is automatically generated in this, uh, uh, in this GNS Hilbert space as a commutant of your right algebra. So, so you actually don't have to uh, start with the left theory at all. In the sense that this can be used as a way to predict, okay? That somehow if you want to describe, uh, describe small excitations, yeah, this can be used as a predict uh, if you want to describe small excitations around the thermal state, even for, for the right theory, you actually have to have connected internal black hole geometry. And, uh, and this can be used as a derivation. So you don't have to start. Uh, so the standard thermal field double state, etc., is a guess based on the geometry on the gravity side. But using this GNS construction, you can actually, I would say you can derive it, okay? Then the left uh, is- okay, I, see, I, see. Uh -huh. I, I had a similar question that, it should be possible to formulate everything in terms of a thermal quantum field theory, right? Because yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah somehow <laughs> this, yeah, somehow this magic of this GNS construction uh, automatically purifies for you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sorry, uh, there was. Uh, no, I think I, I'm saying I want to say that here there's a, a slightly related but maybe different question, which is uh, what happens in the case where we have one CFT in a pure state. So, so far you were talking about a thermal density matrix, I right, guess, right, but yeah, uh, yeah. we could, I, I think the same thing could probably be done for a typical pure state. One would have to be more careful how to take the larger limit and how yeah. to select a typical pure state, but I think probably can be done. And for example, your criterion that uh, to show that the algebra is type three based on the spectral properties of uh, correlators. Yeah. I think uh, you can argue that on a typical pure state at large n, the correlators of single trace operators will be very close or the same as the thermal ones. So I would imagine that some sort of emergent type three property could yeah. potentially be defined for even for pure states of a single well, state. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, so, so for pure states, you should be able to do this, but for, the, for pure states, in the sense that for pure states, to to do the to do the um, yeah so so for pure states physically we expect everything to to be there but but the tricky thing about pure state if you, if you just do the GNS construction on the pure states it's it's not you don't see such structure. It's because the pure states don't give you, it's already purified. No, but I think it's a, maybe a question of order of limits. Uh, for example- Exactly, uh, exactly. So, yeah. indeed, so, so the key for that case is that you have to understand that this not GN limits much more carefully yeah. in, the, in, the, in, in the pure state case. It's because the, for the sum of your double states, the not GN limit is more or less straightforward in the sense we understand much better, but but for the pure state, the large limit is much more trickier, yeah. and so that's just related to that uh, issue. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, what you're saying is that you're saying this because a typical pure state is close to thermal state. Is that the idea that you? Yeah, yeah. So I, I would imagine that I, I mean I guess one if you take a typical pure state and. Uh, you, you act on it with a very large number of single trace operators, large but but not scaling with n. So you, you have to be careful how you take this large and limit. Uh, you can define something that is usually called a code subspace around that particular pure state. And I would imagine that in the large and limit, this will be identified with the GNS Hilbert space that you're talking about. Right. Yeah, yeah, but the key question is just how you really define that limit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just defining that care uh, uh, limit carefully should be very tricky. Yeah, and uh, but we do know somehow that something like that must exist. Yeah. So maybe can I ask a, a question about uh, the, since we're talking about the larger limit now? Uh, if you take the infinite n limit, then there is a clear way of defining the subalgebra n that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But when we start considering one over n corrections, then 
there are issues with uh, the fact that the Hamiltonian may have to be included in the algebra. Yeah. And then it's not so clear how to, um, I mean, is it clear to you how to precisely define a subalgebra in time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think the perturbativity order by order in one over n, this structure should persist. Uh, it's because the, when you include, yeah, so the Hamiltonian, you see, so the tricky thing is the following. So, so the tricky thing is that if you talk about the, the Hamiltonian, yeah, so, so Hamiltonian as an evolution operator and Hamiltonian as a single trace operator, they're different. And they differ by a factor of n. <laughs> and that factor of n is crucial. So, so the Hamiltonian as an evolution operator have the structure is the n times the trace, okay? Uh, n times the trace. But the, but, the, but the Hamiltonian as the single trace operator as we normally define single trace operator, you only have the trace, you don't have the factor of n. And so, so, so the Hamiltonian, which is in the single trace operator algebra, they only generate infinitesimal time translation. Yeah, because, because just related to the standard OPE, uh, 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 that uh, uh, two single trace operator OP is one over n. So, so the so the so the Hamiltonian operator in the operator algebra in the single trace operator algebra uh, when you include one over n correction, still they only generate one over n kind of time steps. So, so that's why I think order by order in one over n expansion, uh, you should still have a type three. Well, uh, uh, this type three structure. Yeah, also from the gravity point of view is very intuitive. In the gravity point of view, you still have a quantum field theory in curved space time, but with a G Newton as a, a, a expansion parameter. And, uh, but then as Witten pointed out, but somehow if you have N, but if you introduce N in some different way, and then, then you have a type two because of this uh, cross product structure. But this cross product structure, which give you a type two infinity, but this type two infinity have to somehow mix different n. Yeah, so, so uh, I basically want to ask you if this discussion that Witten um, presented for uh, the full algebra of single trace operators for all time, yeah, if you have thought how to um, how to apply it in the case where you have this algebra n. So if you start with n and you include the Hamiltonian in this perturbative sense that Witten is talking about, yeah, do you know how it works? Or? No, I uh, I think I I understand mathematically what he's talking, but physically how to interpret he, uh, uh, this type two infinity and, and this cross product, uh, I don't uh, uh, fully understand. It's because the, you have to shuffle and uh, you cannot do it order by order in one way. Mm -hmm. Order by order in one way, you will not have it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I had a similar, okay, I mean, it's a vague question, but uh, to go from type so Witten shows that you can sort of go from type three to type two. Yeah. But you really want to go to type one, right? In the end. In in the end, you want to go to yeah. But, uh, when you go to finite end, you have to go to type one. Yeah. So, so what Witten is doing is that is that finite end? I mean, how should one think about this type two? Yeah. So yeah. So that's why uh, I don't fully understand the uh, so mathematically. I more or less understand he, uh, what he's doing just physically really how to interpret the regime he's defining. I don't fully understand, yeah. Yeah, also he has an entropy and that entropy is not the black hole entropy. And uh, that entropy somehow is also a little bit tricky. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so how to interpret that entropy. Yeah, when you have a type two infinity, then you have entropy. And then how to interpret that entropy physically. Is it divergent or is it finite? It it can be finite, but this but the but the unit of that finiteness is not very defined. It's more like it's more like the standard story. It's more like the standard story when we have generalized second law. So you have the area term, then plus the entropy for the matter. But then there's ambiguity. Yeah, because because the entropy of the matter is infinite. Uh, uh, and matter is in, uh, UV divergent. And also for the area term, you have the uh, uh, divergence corresponding to the remodelization of the Newton constant. And then you have the freedom to put some, some divergent piece either to include it in the G Newton or including 
yeah, anyway, so there's this kind of ambiguity uh, 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 to shift both of them by finite amount. And what, uh, and what finite amount you, uh, you associate with them. Yeah, I think that ambiguity is ready to that, yeah. Yeah, so, so in his construction, there's no area term yet, yeah. I, uh, I have a question. Uh, so uh, the answer might be obvious to some members of the audience, but uh, it's not to me, so I'll ask it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, morally, at least, uh, your construction seems very similar to the uh, Papadodimus Raju construction of mirror operators. Uh, so uh, how does this construction differ from theirs? So I think the so the mirror operator so the mirror operator is automatic in the server field double case. So the mirror operator is non-trivial. Uh, in the in the in the single-sided black hole, and uh, there is a highly non-trivial. I think it's a, it's a beautiful uh, it's a it's a beautiful guess in the sense that the uh, somehow there must exist such kind of mirror operator in the uh, in the um, in the single-sided black hole case. And uh, but the, yeah it, yeah this is related to the question Kiriakos uh, 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 mentioned earlier for the single-sided black hole just to. Physically, you feel they must be there, but somehow to mathematically construct them is highly non-trivial. But for the, for the thermal field double case, such operator, uh, uh, for the thermal field double case, this question somehow become trivial because thermal field double case, such mirror operator, is just the, uh, operate on the left side. Hmm. And uh, so they're automatically there. But just to make a small comment, uh, one of the features of these mirror operators is that for a pure state is that they have to be state dependent because they are determined by the entanglement pattern. And I guess if we apply this uh, half-sided modular inclusion story for a pure state or a mm -hmm. typical pure state, uh, I, I would imagine that this Z operator will, will depend on the microstate that we are starting with because it is defined by the modular Hamiltonian of M and of N. Yeah. Yeah. So it would reproduce this state dependent uh, property, I would imagine, of the interior operators. Right, right, yeah. So, yeah, so this G certainly will be, uh, certainly will be state dependent, but the, but the key question is we know there must be state independent aspect of this G operator. Because we know even though, uh, even though uh, uh, somehow each macro state is different, but the, the single-sided black, black hole geometry, they do have irreversible features. Which are independent of the uh, of those macro states, and so so in the sense that the um, yeah. Okay. 